Let's explore some introductory material for strength of materials. Quick overview of the course. Uh, it builds heavily on statics, MET 111, and materials, 141. It brings forces from statics and properties of materials from 141. So if you add those two courses together, essentially you get this course. Now, that doesn't mean we're rehashing old things. Uh, we're building on things that you've learned in the past. So what we'd like to do is understand how forces affect materials and structures and how those materials respond to force that's applied. Sometimes you apply enough force to a material and it shatters or you apply force to a material and it deflects. So we need to understand how materials behave in response to forces so that we can ensure that our designs always work. Now, there's a couple of different terms we're going to use, strength, stiffness, stability, and you really need to understand what we mean by them. Strength, when you, when you think of strength, you might think of a, a bodybuilder or a backhoe or something that's very strong, but really strength in our context is the ability of material to carry a load. Stiffness, on the other hand, is the ability of material to resist deflection. So something is very stiff if it resists deflection. My daughter and I have been riding the bikes quite a bit over the summer, and there's a, a bike I ride. It's a three-wheel bike. It's got a wheel in the back and two in the front called a tadpole configuration. On the back is a fender, and the fenders, actually all three wheels have fenders, but the, they're really good because they keep water from coming up on you. So if we ride through a puddle or whatever, it doesn't splash all over me, which is nice. Um, but the rear fender on this bike is particularly interesting because the way I... I get ready to go is I just put our bikes in the back of my truck and we drive down to the Easton Bridge and ride across the bridge and through the park and have a good time. Well, if I don't think to strap down this bike, it rolls back and forth in the truck as I'm making corners and putting on the brakes and so forth. Well, if that back fender on the back wheel presses against the the tailgate, what happens is it, it sort of smashes that fender and there's two members that support the back and are supposed to hold the fender out away from the tire. Well, if those, those members get bent, then the uh, fender can rub on the tire, which actually consumes quite a bit of energy, and I have to bend them back out. Now, when I bend them back out, there's actually two of them, one on either side of the fender, and if I don't bend them equally, what will happen is the fender can be offset and rub, and, and really, even if they're bent properly and then they're, at, they're in the right position, the fender can move laterally relative to the tire and actually rub on the tire, so it doesn't have a lot of stiffness to resist deflection. Now fortunately there's not a lot of side load most of the time on the fender and so if I get it adjusted right it, it works. But the the design of these members could be such that the uh, fender would be a lot stiffer in the lateral direction and it wouldn't be able to contact the tire. So that's a, a design failure, something they didn't consider when they designed this or I guess that I didn't consider when I purchased the fender. <laughs> Stability is the ability of a material to maintain its current form. So if you think of something like a Coke can, once you're done with a Coke can, if you crush it with your foot or with your hands, however you crush it, foot's probably safer, the load that you're applying to that can is so large that the material cannot be stable. It doesn't maintain its current form. It crushes instead. And that's a buckling phenomenon. There's a lot of buckling phenomena that can occur in structural members, for example. Um, now, if you have something like uh, turbine blades ro rotating around, if they get too hot, they can so-called creep. They can uh, change their size and their shape, and that can cause problems. So that's a lack of stability. Um, even plastics can be unstable. Uh, so the ability of material to maintain its form is what we'll refer to as stability. So why should we study strength of materials? What benefit does it cause or does it give us? Well. Structural members have to support loads. In particular, things like bridges have to support the weight of traffic. Um, you know, a bicycle, like I was mentioning a minute ago, has to resist forces from pedaling. Um, there's a lot of interesting designs out there for bicycles. I really am interested in recumbents because they're so comfortable. And they you typically have a lower uh, profile to the wind as well, so uh, there's a little bit of efficiency at higher speeds to be had. Um, also because of the way that you lay back and your back is against a seat, you can push with your legs and get more of a leg workout rather than just pushing against your weight on a, a typical bike. 
but there's an interesting design called a tripendo. If you get the chance, look it up. It's a, a bike that actually leans into the corner. So it's, it's got two wheels in front and one in the back, a tadpole design, as I've mentioned. And as you turn the, I don't remember what it has, a yoke or what it is to, to steer, but as you turn it, the entire bike leans. And so you can corner better in these things. The interesting thing about this bike is that the body is made out of a, uh, I don't know if it's a carbon fiber or fiberglass or what, but it's not just a regular steel frame. And it's really interesting because the frame has to be designed such that it resists the forces from pedaling. You don't want the whole frame to wobble and twist. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's plenty of examples where the strength of the materials are critical in their application. What else is there about strength of materials? Well, anything we design has to support the loads applied to it. And a lot of times our structures are designed to transfer load from one point to another. So that's a, a reason for studying it. Obviously, we want to make sure that designs don't have excessive deflection uh, or other failure modes. Sometimes you design so that the, the elements fail at a particular load. That is another option. Uh, but that's less common. So why do we engineer things? Well, we want to make sure they're safe, for one thing. Of course, you can make pretty much anything safe by throwing more steel at it or more material at it. Uh, you can make a drive shaft out of butter if you had enough butter. The problem is that it's not practical. So a lot of times you have to engineer things just to make them work. But beyond that, we want to make sure that they are safe. So we want to understand the design and uh, study it and make sure that it will work. Also, we want to avoid failure. Um, another reason is to reduce costs. If you just add material, well then the plane doesn't get off the ground, right? Sometimes adding material is not a solution that works. So that's the reason that we engineer things. Uh, I included a picture of a, a coffee table someone made and you can see that that jack could probably lift, you know, who knows what kind of heavy equipment. It's just they're supporting a, a table that might have the load of a remote control. So this is an obviously far over-engineered uh, thing. Of course, it's, <clears throat> you know, the purpose of this is aesthetic. Whoever built this likes it, and I think it's neat, but, you know, it's, it's an example of something that's far above the capacity necessary. Another example, if you've ever gone across the walking bridge between Jeffersonville and downtown Louisville, it used to be a train bridge. And so if you think about the load of the people going across that bridge, that's tiny by comparison to the loads that that bridge was designed to support. So even if the bridge is, you know, it's, it's very old. I don't know how old it is. It was probably built in the 20s or so is my guess from looking at it. Um, but that, that bridge, even as old as it is, will easily support the weight that's applied to it today. Um, I'm sure they've tested it and, and, you know, looked at it and inspected it to make sure it would, just for safety. But you pretty much know that it's going to support whatever light human loads, foot traffic that you apply to it. You could drive a car across it, I'm sure, and it would be fine. Types of failure. There are three primary failure modes that we're interested in. One is fracture. That's what you typically think of when you think of a strength of materials course. If the material breaks apart, that's a fracture. Okay. Um, if there's excessive deformation, though, that can also be a failure. I changed my garage around. When I bought my house, the garage didn't have a garage door in the front. In fact, it had been converted to living space. Well, I wanted a garage and the conversion wasn't all that good, so I converted it back to a garage. The interesting thing is that originally the garage had a door on the front and I wanted that door to be, well, not that door, but I wanted a door to be on the back. So I actually took out the back of the garage, I actually changed the roof quite a lot, and put in a, a header beam and structure to support uh, the uh, uh, you know the garage door opening. Well, I wanted a wide door. I've got a 16-foot door, so a two-car garage. And in in designing it, I was cheap. I didn't want to go out and buy a, a beam to put in there. So I did some calculations and assumed that, you know if I use wood that was I think two by twelves or something like that, how many stacks thick would it need to be to prevent excessive deflection? Because actually your eye can see deflection fairly well in the lines of a home. And so I knew that I wanted it to look good and you know I didn't want to stand back from the house and it looked like the garage door, you know, the, the beam at the top of it was bowing. And so I wanted a maximum of, I think it was an eighth or a sixteenth of an inch of deflection in the center of the 16 foot span. And so I calculated how much wood I would need and how, you know, how many layers I would need of two by uh, 
to prevent excessive deflection and make it look good. Now, sometimes excessive deformation causes the machine to not work. If you're talking about a, a machine that has a shaft riding in it, for example, if that shaft deforms too far, gears riding on that shaft could come out of mesh, or the mesh could be improper and, and the gears wear excessively. So excessive deformation is, there are multiple reasons beyond aesthetics for avoiding it. Um, Avoiding buckling is another uh, reason for this course, and we have a whole chapter devoted to buckling, and so we'll study that as we go. So those are the three primary types of failure that we will uh, approach in this class. Now one thing that you know about me, if you know me very well, is that I push units on students, right? I require that you understand units. If you get out of your four-year degree and you've had me for several classes and you still don't understand units, I have failed, <laughs> okay? So I require that you use units in all of your calculations in my class. And so if we quickly review uh, some of the standard uh, units that we'll use, there are, of course, SI and English units, but uh, the uh, quantity or the dimensions that we use are length, time, force, mass, temperature, and angle. Uh, SI units are uh, meters, seconds, newtons, kilograms. You can read them there. Kelvin, degrees Celsius, of course, radians, degrees. And in English units, you'll see things like feet, seconds, pounds, slugs for mass or pounds mass, degrees Fahrenheit, uh, Rankine, uh, degrees for angles or radians uh, are also used. So the really the only common unit between these are the time units. Other than that, there's a different unit for length, force, <laughs> mass, you know, temperature, and angle. Although the angle, uh, really they're the same. It's just it depends on which one's more common. So. Um, there are other units as well, and there are some handy conversion factors I'll point out as we go along, but make sure you use units in all your calculations and all your work. Something really quick that students commonly are confused about is the difference between weight and mass. Weight and mass are two different things. You cannot take a slug of mass and calculate slugs of force. There's no such thing. You can't take a gram of mass and calculate a gram force. Yeah, okay, there's a kilogram force, but that's sort of a... Uh, <laughs> taking the SI units in the wrong way in my opinion but it's it's a thing so but my point is there's a difference between the dimension of mass and the dimension of force which weight is in the dimension of force so weight is a force it's a very particular type of force it's a force that's generated by gravity so uh, just gravitational acceleration between two masses if you want to calculate the magnitude of the weight you have to multiply the mass of the object by the acceleration of gravity and of course you know those two numbers they're probably in your memory by now but if not there they are there's one the acceleration for uh, or gravitational acceleration for SI units and for English units the goals we have for the things we design and make is that they be safe strong inexpensive that's really what we're doing so the more material you put on a design the more it's going to cost to make now usually material costs are not the primary cost of any product uh, some it's true that it is but in many designed things especially consumer products the material is not the major portion of cost you would be very surprised how low the value is of all the materials that go into your car I don't remember right off what it is but some very small fraction of the purchase price and looking at that you might say well we're being ripped off with cars well maybe so but on the other hand the value of the car is the configuration of those materials and the design of those components so that they uh, you know achieve their intended function um, now there are times when engineers take too much material away I have a table saw and I'll you probably hear me complain about this more than once but it's got a fence on it the fence is what you know you, you put across the table saw in order to guide material through the blade so that's where you set your width and, and so forth. Well, the back side of this thing uh, has a moving arm that's supposed to clamp on the rail. And when you put you push down a handle on the front, it's supposed to clamp in the back. And that, that clamp is a, an arm that pivots on a pin, and the pin is in a plastic molded piece. So guess which part broke? Obviously the plastic molded piece. And, and so you just imagine a pin in a, a couple of pieces of plastic if they had simply added more plastic material around that and made the the support around the pin thicker it wouldn't have broken or at least it would have taken a whole lot more load to break so there are many times when people try to minimize costs of things by removing material when it's not really necessary a few more pennies worth or you know, fractions of a penny's worth of plastic would have easily prevented the failure mode that I experienced 
Uh, but anyway, so we want our items to be inexpensive, and minimizing material can be uh, one way. Think of the Titanic. Uh, think of the material that goes into the Titanic or any cruise ship. Anytime you have a very large product, uh, cutting material out is important in order to minimize cost. Of course, obviously, <laughs> Uh, the Titanic, too, too much material was taken out, or the wrong material was used because it's, there was a catastrophic failure. Now, sometimes designs can only take so much. I mean, if you take a huge ship and you go full steam ahead and just literally ram it into an iceberg, some ships are designed to take that, but many are not. Uh, I don't know if you know this, but cruise ships today actually are larger than the Titanic, and yet you don't commonly hear about one of those going down. But Anyway, I think our engineering has gotten better today, probably since then. We understand more about materials. We have newer, better materials available for making things. I'm not saying the engineers back at that time were incompetent. There are problems today. There are plenty of failures. There was the, the bridge on college campus in Florida. I can't remember which one it was. You probably remember that in the last couple of years that, that failed tragically and ended up killing some people. Um, so we're, we're trying to make things that are safe, they're strong, and they're inexpensive. So studying this course will hopefully help you understand materials better and in particular understand stress better so that you can design things better or at least fix things that are poorly designed and improve designs. Now, as I said, this course does build on statics, but there were some problems with statics. There were some assumptions built into it that really are not true. One of the things that statics assumes is that all materials are rigid. They don't deflect at all except for maybe a spring. In reality, all materials are flexible to some extent. I uh, built a a uh, mantle for my fireplace. I cut a hole in the side of my house and built a chimney and put a fireplace in because I wanted one. And it's it's kind of nice. It's a gas log now and I actually bought the uh, valve and figured out what to do to uh, have a switch on the side where I can just flip a switch and the, the valve automatically controls the uh, gas coming out the propane into the, the gas log. I think I paid, I don't know, I probably got a thousand dollars or so in the whole thing including the, the insert, the gas log, everything, the valve. And if you look at gas logs themselves and you try to buy one, a lot of times, you know, a setup like this is easily five, you know, six, seven thousand dollars, depending on what you get. So I've got a very low cost but very nice system because of course I can figure these things out and understand them and make them safe. But why did I bring all this up? Well, in building this um, um, well, I guess my point with that is that if you understand things, you can engineer them and you can make them work better. And so you can use less material in designs and yet have a good functioning design. But I brought up the fireplace because I, I bought some granite. It was uh, basically cut off pieces from countertops. There's a guy down the road that installs countertops and his dad sells granite. So I went down there, found some pieces of granite. You know, he's the kind of guy that you can cut a deal with, so it's kind of fun. So I bought uh, a couple pieces of granite and I, I was cutting the granite in order to make it the size that was needed and I ended up with a strip of granite that was probably a quarter inch wide or so and standard countertop height its its width was you know inch and a quarter or so and it was probably three four feet long and it was really interesting because I could lay this piece on its its uh, on the cut face so now the thin side was vertical and the thick side was horizontal and I could lay it out you know three foot span or so and you could literally see it deflect it was the neatest thing because usually you think of rock and stone and granite as things that simply don't deflect at all but the reality is that even rock deflects if you go hiking and you stand up on top of some big rock that rock is literally deflecting a small amount in order to support your your load even though your load is small so the reality is that all materials are flexible to some extent uh, so, in a sense, all materials are somewhat springy. All materials act like springs. Another problem with statics is that it assumes that uh, we won't have any excess support. But in reality, things are statically indeterminate, and we have excess support. And there are reasons for having excess support. And in statics, you can't solve problems that are statically indeterminate. You have to understand how materials flex and how much they will flex and their cross-sectional properties and that's uh, something we'll rectify in this course. We will improve on statics and you will be able to solve statically indeterminate problems. Alright, um, another problem with statics is that it always assumes that forces are applied at a single point but in reality there's no such thing as well okay there is such a thing as force but in reality Force is an integration of pressure, right? It's an integration of e even weight, right? Every molecule in your body is attracted by the earth, and so the, your weight is a sum of all of the pull of all of the, 
the atoms and molecules in your body to Earth. And if you think about contact, just you know, a, a point contact, well really my finger is applying pressure, right? And the, the integral, the added up, all that pressure added up over area is force. So inside of materials we can also think of something that's sort of like a pressure. It's called stress, but we'll see a little bit later about exactly how we define stress and what it is. So what about statically indeterminate problems? Well, here's a fairly simple statically indeterminate problem. We've got two springs. They're concentric with one another. And we apply a force F to those two springs. Imagine just putting a plate on the top and deflecting the springs in amount delta. Now, the outer spring has a spring constant K1. The inner spring has a spring constant K2. We can write a statics equation, right? You don't need strength of materials to approach this problem. You can write an equation that says that the sum of forces are zero because the spring's not, you know, it's, it's static, it's sitting still with the load applied. Just think of a weight being at, uh, set on top of these two. And if you write a balance in the y direction, summing forces, the external internal force F less the forces applied from the two springs equals zero because everything's balanced out. And you, the easiest way to think about this is think of a static balance on a plate that's between the springs and the force. I should have added that into this, this figure, but I didn't think to until now. Now, if you think about what's going on here, we've got two unknown forces. We've got the force in spring one and the force in spring two. You can't solve that first equation by itself. Statics is inadequate because this is a very simple statically indeterminate system. Now, if you start thinking about deformation though, you might be able to do something with it. So the deformation of spring one is equal to the deformation of the spring two, and we can simply call that delta. You saw this in the figure and assumed it from the beginning, but let's state that explicitly in our next equation, our so-called deformation equation. Now, if we know the spring constant, we can relate the deformation of the two, right? Because really, the spring equation, the linear spring equation, is F equals KX, right? Or F equals K delta. If we rearrange that equation, write F over K, then that's equal to delta. And all we're really doing is solving for the deflection or writing it in terms of force and spring constant on the left-hand side for spring one. And on the right-hand side, we're doing the same thing for spring two. And we know the deflection of the two springs are equal. So we can write this equation and look at what we've got now. We've got an equation that relates the force in spring one to the force in spring two. And now we've got another equation besides our statics equation because we considered deflection and we considered the springiness or the stiffness, if you will. That's what K really is. It's a stiffness of each spring. Now if we substitute these, this equation into the equilibrium equation, now we can solve for, say, F2 or F1 in terms of the externally applied force F. And this, from a high level uh, view, is basically the approach we take in strength of materials in order to solve statically indeterminate problems. But understand, you have to know the uh, spring constant, the effective spring constant of the material in order to do this, and you have to deal with deflection. Now further, there are some ideas from statics that I want to expound on. I want to take them a little bit further. You've solved a problem like this in statics, I'm sure. And think for a moment, what's the first step in solving this problem? Well, you should know that it is to draw a free body diagram of the whole truss system and solve for the reaction forces. Okay, You see a pinned uh, point on the left, you see a rolling point on the right, so we've got a, a, a fixed free, uh, you probably wouldn't call it fixed free, I don't know what terminology you would use, but a, a pinned uh, side and a roller side. But you would solve, first of all, for the reaction. So if you do that, you'd end up transforming the problem into something like this. So these are the, the correct uh, reactions at the supports. And of course, we're assuming there's no horizontal force in this case. I'm not trying to go to something statically indeterminate anymore. So we've got this truss and we've got the, the reactions. Well. Could we go a step further? Sure, you always do, right? You want to get the forces within the members, and so what do you do? Well, you imagine cutting the members, and you use either the method of sections or the method of pins. I'm showing you the method of sections because I've, I've got a point here. And you imagine a free body that is cut and the other part just doesn't exist. So what forces would have to be applied in member D, E, and F in order to maintain static equilibrium given these two loads, one being a reaction and the other one being an externally supplied load. Well, you can solve that in statics, right? Well, that's great, but did you ever think when you were working these kinds of problems in statics, did you ever think, wait a second, how often in the real world are there two force members? I mean, because any of these members are going to have weight, and that weight acts 
in the negative y direction. And so that's a load that is transverse. How can any member really be a two-force member? Well, you're right. You probably got to the point in statics where you thought, okay, I'm, I'm just going to solve the problems, get through the course, and be done. But you probably thought what I'm suggesting at one point, and you were right. There can be other forces within the member besides an axial force. And to have a two-force member, the only force you can have within that member is an axial force that, mo that uh, points from one pin to the other. In reality, structures are more like this, where if you have uh, a, uh, this is a very simple beam here, it's just a sort of an A shape without a support in the, the center, there's rollers on the left and a pin on the right, uh, but if you think about what's going on here, not only could there be forces F1 and F2, which are axial forces that, are, that you are used to dealing with from statics, there could also be a moment, okay, or a twist within the beam. There could be a shear load where the shear is a transverse. It's, it's perpendicular to the direction of the axis of the beam. So in this class, it turns out that all of the loads, the forces and the moments within the beam, can be written in terms of these three. An axial load, uh, which is, uh, uh, well, an axial load, a moment load, and a shear uh, force. So all of these things, uh, can represent any load situation we have within a, uh, a beam. And you may have even written shear or, or solved shear and moment problems uh, before now, but we're going to do that again and then use that information in our, our class. So what about the relationship between force, pressure, and area? Well, force is mass times acceleration, of course, so that's what pulls down on this, this dancer's body, and that has to be supported somehow, right? So. Here I've shown the first, uh, second, and third positions, I believe they're called. Uh, but, you know, going from a, a beginner ballet, uh, uh, ballet uh, practitioner all the way up to advanced, where the first position, the student has both feet firmly on the ground. In this case, the force or the, the weight of the, the person is supported on a relatively large uh, area. So you see if the, the person is 500 newtons, then they've got you know a foot area of about 325 square centimeters, then that's one and a half newtons per square centimeter. That's the pressure applied to the bottom of the feet. The next position, you see the, the dancers up on their toes. And so it's just the tip of the toes that are supporting. And there's, there's two feet, though. It's a lot less area now, though, and this is a much more difficult position because of that. I certainly wouldn't want to try it myself. I'm no... <laughs> ballet practitioner. I couldn't do it. I, you know, it's it funny. I never really was interested in ballet. And then I went and saw the Nutcracker. And maybe it's a weird way to think of it, but as I watched them dance around, I wasn't so much thinking about the art. I was just impressed at the sheer athleticism of the, the, uh, the dancers. And also I was amazed at the choreography and how Nobody was running into anyone. I mean, maybe that's kind of funny to think of, but I was just like, oh my goodness, there's you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 people out there dancing, it looks like, and they're all flying around and you know, moving quickly and spinning, and I thought, wow, how do they not just crash into each other? And there must be some crashing along the way in practice. I can't imagine what that would be like. But I actually appreciate ballet, maybe for the wrong reasons, but I'm just impressed at the athleticism and the fact that they can, you know, uh, do this together in a dance that works and looks beautiful. So, anyway, uh, that's my little uh, ballet. I haven't been to many. I also went and saw Scheherazade mainly because a coworker of mine gave me tickets, and I'm I'm cheap. I don't like paying for these things, but maybe I should get into ballet. It's it's pretty impressive what people can do with their bodies, not just in ballet but in other areas. Human beings are just amazing to me. Anyway, so uh, the area of contact in the second position is much less than before, but let's just assume that the weight remains about the same, and so they still we still have 500 newtons that has to be supported by the floor, but now it's over a much smaller area, and so the, the pressure in the, the toes is much higher than the pressure is in the bottom of the feet from the first position. So once the uh, practitioner is able to stand on one foot in the final picture here, that's very impressive. That's uh, half the area of standing on two tiptoes. Uh, and so the, now the, the stress and the force in the toe is much, much larger. So that's a, hopefully a helpful illustration of the differences between force and pressure. Now there is a relationship between force and stress. Imagine that you've got a member, it's shown on the left there, 
And there's force applied at either end in an attempt to pull the, the member apart. Now, we're going to go ahead and imagine cutting the member, at least in our minds, so that we can make free body diagrams of the upper and lower portions of this member. This is a simple two-force member with a force axial uh, on the member. And there must be some internal force. It's kind of like two hands coupled together holding this thing in the center, right? The, the material has to hold to, to itself, right? The, the two halves have to be bonded together somehow. And of course, we're imagining this, so it's probably all just one uh, homogeneous you know, member. But if you think about what's going on, the force that's applied here would be distributed over the area, especially if you think about applying a force to a point at the top and at the bottom, eventually that force is going to somehow spread out. I mean, I wouldn't think of this as just uh, you know, a thin wire being pulled through this large cross section. Eventually the force would be spread out and carried by all of the material. In that case, we could uh, talk about stress, and, and the stress uh, sorry, I thought I had one more equation there, but the, the stress would be a force per area, kind of like pressure before. So there's a, a, a very good similarity between uh, pressure and stress. They're similar things. They're force per area. In this case, it's a normal stress, but you'll see why that is a little bit later. Now, stress is something that you may or may not know um, relates to stretching. So if you take material and you stretch it, there will be more stress in the material. As a matter of fact, that's how members carry load. They stretch. And as they stretch, they generate stress, and that stress then counteracts the, the force and supports whatever load needs to be supported. So there's this constant relationship between stretching, which is called strain, and the uh, stress within the material. Now, if the stress goes too high, what happens is the material fails. And so there are many ways of measuring how much stretch there is in a given material or a given uh, member. Uh, one way to do this is with photoelastic uh, materials that you can, can look at with special equipment. In particular, uh, you're looking at more of the uh, uh, polarized light and how the material behaves. There are also strain gauges, and maybe you've used strain gauges before, but basically a strain gauge, you can see one in the lower left photo uh, or, or drawing, the strain gauge is just a resistor that's variable, and as you stretch it, the, the traces move apart a little bit and the resistance increases. You can then take this strain gauge and put it into a, what's called a Wheatstone bridge. It's a, a four resistor, well, really more than that. Technically, it's six resistors, including the gauge. But you can put it into a, um, a bridge setup, and by the voltage measurement, infer the amount of strain and therefore the amount of stress. Um, now the photoelastic coatings that you can put on things are really interesting. Again, you have to look at these with polarized lenses or polarized light in order to see what's going on, but these coatings can either be uh, sort of shrunk onto or, or pasted onto uh, materials. And you look at some of these, these parts and they're very complicated. And so, you know, in this course you wouldn't be able to, even when you're done, calculate the stress in a complicated uh, material or, or part like this. Uh, it would be much better to just apply a photoelastic coating and look for regions of very large stress when the machine is in operation. Uh, now I will tell you a little bit later how you could approach this problem besides photoelastic coatings, uh, but this is one fairly inexpensive way to uh, to analyze stress, and it's it's a very hands-on um, uh, visual way of looking for areas within a part that are highly stressed for the sake of testing or redesign or, or whatever is necessary. Another way to do this is with finite element analysis. So you take the uh, fairly complicated part you put into CAD and in CAD the, the system calculates uh, you know deflection. Basically you, you make what's called a mesh of the, the part. You can see a mesh of a, a human uh, uh, joint there on the right. And basically it's called a finite element method because what you're doing is you're just assuming that the body is actually made up of little bitty pieces that are tied together and have to have force between them. And you're just solving a heck of a lot of statics problems. You know, you could have, you know, hundreds of thousands of these mesh elements that are connected to one another and given an external load and some constraints, calculate how much they deflect knowing the material properties. And this is a really good way of uh, estimating or, or locating areas that are going to be highly stressed and estimating a value of the stress in that area. 
Uh, I have used finite element analysis. It is included in SOLIDWORKS. I'm not going to talk to you much about it. In fact, I don't even intend to use it. There is a, another course after this, I believe it's MET 411 that Professor Dews teaches, where you can learn more about finite element analysis. I highly recommend it. And, and the reason I included this slide, I want to tell you a little bit about this course. The problems that you see in this course, I know all students want real world problems, but the problems you see in this course, some of them may seem real world, some of them may not. The purpose of the problems and the things we study in this course is less about you being able to go down, and, you know, get a job, sit at your desk, and use the equations I've shown you to solve problems. That's really not the way it goes. The purpose of this class is more to sharpen your intuition and your understanding about this phenomenon called stress and strain and how materials behave in relationship to these things. That's more what it's about. You see, there's some good things to know. Uh, there's some very basic things, like it turns out there's only two types of stress that we care about, uh, shear stress and normal stress. And we'll talk about that more in subsequent uh, presentations, but really those are the two types of stress you need to think about and concentrate on. It doesn't really matter how complicated the problem are, those are the two types of stress that we care about. There are some overarching themes, like for example, uh, fatigue failure. Fatiguing material causes material to fail, especially where cracks can propagate. And so that's something you need to know and understand and look out for. And figuring out that something has failed by fatigue is actually relatively straightforward. It's, in some cases are difficult, but a lot of times you can tell that a failure is a fatigue type failure, especially if you understand the application of the components or of the machine. Um, so I've used finite element analysis. I took a course in it when I was studying. I used it when I worked for Amatrol. There was a particular part I designed that uh, everyone was concerned about, but I you know, figured out the finite element analysis software in SOLIDWORKS. Already had the, the particular parts drawn up and I analyzed what would happen. Now an interesting thing about this, one more plug for this course, it's very easy with a computer to generate pretty pictures like you see on the left. That doesn't mean those pictures are correct. Okay, That doesn't mean that the, the stress, the 1,112 PSI, if you can read that, that doesn't mean that yeah, it's probably plus or minus a PSI. No, it could be off quite a bit. As a matter of fact, it's pretty easy to make pretty pictures with a computer that mean nothing. So the, the term, of course, is garbage in, garbage out. You've probably heard this before. You can generate a lot of garbage with a computer very quickly. In fact, when I was growing up, I had a sign in my room that said, uh, to err is human, but to really louse things up takes a computer. And I believe that more now than I did even then. Um, so when I... When I used finite element analysis in SOLIDWORKS, it turns out the part I was designing was kind of like a cantilevered beam. It was like a short cantilevered beam. So before I trusted the results that I got from the software, as a matter of fact, before I got results from the software, I did a fairly straightforward, simple, approximate analysis of just a cantilevered beam that had dimensions close to what I had and was made of the material that I had. It turned out the beam was actually curved a little bit, but I ignored that. And I calculated and estimated the maximum stress in the material. And then I went to the SOLIDWORKS uh, finite element analysis. Uh, I've forgotten what it's called now. It's a, I think it was a tool pack at the time. No, it wasn't a tool pack. Whatever it was, I, I used it. And when I got the stress results that it predicted, they were on the same order of magnitude of what I had calculated. And so I knew the results were most likely reasonable. And that's another value of this course is estimating stress in things and then going and using finite element analysis or perhaps uh, you know approximating stress in a more complicated part. So bear with me this course has a lot of things that may seem like oh well where would I ever apply this in the real world well maybe you would never apply it. The point though is for you to understand the principles that you're trying to learn in this class.